This is lecture 25, the subject matter of patents, part one, products of nature. In this lecture, we're going to start with an overview of the subject matter limits, how section 101 fits into the standards for patentability, um, and why we're doing it last uh, in the course, among other things. And then we're going to talk about the primary restriction that arises when we're talking about the natural products component of Section 101, and, and that is patenting life. It mainly applies when patentees are seeking to get claims on life forms, and, and so that's what we'll primarily be talking about in the lecture. So first, a quick overview of subject matter limits. Um, we've looked at this sort of chart uh, for the whole uh, course, which is the standards for patentability. We sort of moved away from the standards of patentability uh, after uh, we talked about inventorship, section 116, uh, and now we're back to it. And the reason I think it's important to um, do this at the end of the course rather than closer to the beginning of the course when we did the rest of the standards for patentability is that I think that really section 101, as you'll find out as we dig a little deeper into the cases, is primarily a policy-based uh, statutory scheme and 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 although you can certainly say that the rest of the standards for patentability are all about policy right they're all trying to balance um, uh, the benefits to the public versus the benefits given to the inventor um, and weigh those two things against each other when you get to section 101 and the issues of section 101 are certain things patentable or not patentable as a category uh, not merely in terms of their disclosure or how broadly they're drawn or something like that, but as a category, that's a different kind of question. And I think it's, it's really quite fundamentally different than the rest of the standards for patentability. And I think that having the context of the entire course uh, uh, behind you is important when evaluating uh, these um, uh, competing arguments with respect to Section 101. So that's why I put it at the end, and that's what we're going to do uh, over the next uh, week or two. So Section 101 is, is the key section here, and it defines uh, inventions that are patentable. Whoever invents or discovers any new and useful process, machine, manufacturer, or composition of matter, or any new and useful improvement thereof may obtain a patent, therefore, subject to the conditions and requirements of this title. So there are two components to Section 101. One uh, that I've highlighted here uh, derives from the word useful, uh, and that's what we understand to be the utility requirement. That is, all patentable inventions must be useful. Uh, they must have a, a utility. Uh, we will talk about that in Class um, uh, 26, I believe. Yes, Class 26. Uh, so um, that stay tuned for that. But the basic concept there is that we want, um, we obviously don't want to give patents for things that don't have any use to society. Um, uh, so therefore, there is a standard uh, for utility. Here, and what we're more interested in for the next few couple of classes is this follows uh, this component, which is in order to get a patent, it has to fall within this uh, subject matter. It has to be a process, a machine, a manufacturer, or composition of matter. This is what's known as the subject matter requirement. Now, the first thing is a statutory matter to understand is, is just reading the language here, process, machine, manufacturer, composition of matter, you might, at first glance, think, wow, that's awful broad. In fact, what things are there that wouldn't fit into one of these categories of either a process, a machine, a manufacturer, or a composition of matter? I mean, between compositions of matter and processes, not to mention machines and manufacturers, you have a very, very broad statement of coverage for uh, patentable inventions. And you would be right. Uh, as we'll find out when we look into some of the statutory, uh, the legislative history surrounding uh, Section 101, Congress was well aware when it wrote this language that, that this was a very broad statement of uh, patentability. Uh, and from a policy perspective, I think that's probably the right approach. I think that we, in general, want to 
maintain as broad a scope of the patent system as possible to encompass as many kinds of new technologies as possible. And at least in my personal perspective, I think we're better off using um, uh, concepts such as disclosure, the Section 112 requirements, novelty and non-obviousness as the screens for what things are patentable and not, or not, rather than Section 101, which is categories. Right? So as a statutory matter, the categories are really broad. Right? Now, however broad they are, the courts, in particular the Supreme Court, uh, over several decades has developed two different categories of limitations on subject matter. Right? So the way that the courts have interpreted the language here, process, machine, manufacturer, composition of matter, is that it has, uh, in fact, two distinct limitations. And the first limitation, and the one we're going to talk about in this class, is the products of nature or living things limitation. And this includes living organisms or naturally occurring products. Can those things be patented? Generally, we think no, uh, and we'll discuss exactly what we mean by products of nature or living things. The second category uh, is mathematical algorithms, sometimes also interchangeably known as abstract ideas. Right? So, so the idea here is that there are certain kinds of inventions that even though you're not patenting biological life forms, living organisms, something like that, that are nonetheless not eligible for patent protection because they are too abstract, too mathematical. Um, and we will talk about that in class 25, exactly why we would want to do that and, and what exactly that means. The mathematical algorithms uh, component um, encompasses questions about should we uh, allow the patentability of computer software because software of course is at uh, some level merely a process of instructions right and, and in some ways the way that uh, software can be claimed is quite broad and abstract. What about business methods, right? A method of doing business. Uh, is that eligible subject matter? Setting aside issues, of course, of disclosure, novelty, and non-obvious, uh, if I invent a new way of doing business, can I actually get a patent for that? All right. So that's where a lot of the policy uh, happens as well. So today, of course, we're going to talk about products in nature or living things. So let's, let's dive in. Patenting life. So Diamond versus Chakrabarty uh, is uh, perhaps the key case uh, with respect to, to patenting uh, life forms. Uh, the, the technology here was a uh, organism, a uh, bacterial organism. Uh, the particular uh, feature of this organism was that it uh, would eat oil. Um, so obviously had some uh, significant utility for things like oil spills and other kinds of cleanup. Um, and it was a synthetic organism, um, although living, so it was a living real organism, it was certainly a, a, a living um, uh, organism, but it wasn't one that occurred in nature, right? Three types of claims were at issue, right? So the process of producing the bacterial organism was uh, claimed. Um, the, the various sequence of steps used to produce this bacterial organism. Two, the method of using uh, the organism, uh, in particular this preferred method of using it to, to uh, eat oil. Uh, and then three, the bacterial organism itself. Okay, um, The examiner, the, the PTO examiner, allowed claims one and two, the, this, the process of producing and the method of using, uh, but not denied patentability uh, for number three on the grounds uh, that bacterial organisms were living things and living things were beyond the scope of Section 101. So the first question you should ask yourself is, does that have any real impact on the scope of coverage? Right? If uh, I can patent the process of, of making the organism and the method of using it, well, haven't I essentially uh, achieved what I wanted from claim three uh, through those two claims? And the answer is perhaps, but perhaps not, right? It, it very well might be, for example, that there are other ways of creating this bacterial organism uh, 
that I've invented. Uh, you, there might be different kinds of steps that I haven't thought about, different kinds of technology for creating organisms or bacteria that I don't know about yet that new technologies might come along. And so therefore, the protection of claim one might not be as robust as it seems uh, at the moment. And there could also be lots of potential uses. There could be a lot of uses for this bacterial organism that I am not aware of or that don't become immediately clear for some period of time. And therefore, uh, I won't be able to cover under, um, uh, under claim two. So although probably for particular purposes at that moment, at the moment of the uh, the claim uh, was filed, uh, claims one and two probably achieved pretty much what the inventor wanted. Um, it's still important in terms of uh, long-term flexibility and, and full scope for the inventor, uh, arguably, to, to get a claim on the organism itself. Right? And so Chakrabarty argues that, that he should also uh, be allowed to patent the organism itself. So the, the Supreme Court goes through the analysis, and, and they note that there are Section 101 uh, categories, right? And this is uh, sort of the statutory language, statutory interpretation point I made earlier. Um, clearly, this claim falls within um, uh, the either manufacture or composition of matter um, uh, categories here. Uh, and yet the court doesn't think that that's um, uh, necessarily uh, the end of the story, right? So the court sort of admits, well, it's clearly some sort of a composition of matter, but then it notes that over the years, uh, courts have interpreted those um, subject matter categories to not include um, certain kinds of living things, right? And the real issue here, as I think I noted at the beginning of, of uh, the intro to this uh, class, is pretty much about policy. Right? And, the, and the question is, are we going to, as a matter of public policy, allow the kinds of claims that Chakrabarty is asserting here, claims to bacterial organisms, to living things? And that's where the court sort of takes off from there and, and tries to deal with it. And ultimately, the court decides that these are patentable, that these uh, living organisms are patentable. Uh, and the reason the court says they are living or that they are patentable is that they are non-naturally occurring, right? These are truly synthetic man-made and that the fact that they're living, that they have some sort of what we would describe as biological activity, uh, does not negate their patentability. Um, and they are, because they are not natural, they are clearly made by man. Uh, and therefore, that falls within Section 101, right? So the answer, I think the rule, the, the core rule of Chakrabarty, uh, and note this is a 5-4 decision, uh, is that uh, non-natural or man-made living things may be patented, right? So they take sort of this distinctive line between things that, that are naturally occurring and things that are not naturally occurring as the, the key decision point uh, in this case. So the question, uh, can you patent living things, is yes, as long as they are non-naturally occurring living things, right? Uh, so as long as they're man-made, they don't occur in nature, um, then the fact that they're living versus non-living is not uh, relevant to the Section 101 question. Now note that even if you pass the Section 101 threshold, that does not necessarily mean that you can get a patent. Right, because there are still Section 102, Section 103, Section 112 in particular. Right, so you still have to fully disclose. You still have to um, show that it's novel, and you still have to show that it's not obvious. Right, so all of the discussion that we're having here with respect to Section 101, it, the caveat here is that you still may not get a patent uh, if it's not if it doesn't meet the rest of the standards for patentability uh, that are listed in, in Title 35. So some of the key language in, in uh, this uh, in Diamond versus Chakra Party that I wanted to point out to you is that the court notes that the committee reports accompanying the 1952 Patent Act inform us that Congress intended statutory subject matter to include anything under the sun that is made by man. Right. So that's essentially where the court draws out this distinction between man-made living things and non man-made and naturally occurring living things, right? Is that, that it seems clear that Congress wanted to sweep Section 101 very broadly 
and it wanted to encompass everything that, that could be conceived of by man, made by man. And here we have an organism that, yes, it's a living organism, uh, but it is one that is um, uh, made by man, and therefore, at least under uh, this broad concept that Congress seems to be going for under Section 101, would be patentable. All right, so that's an important thing, and that is that section of the committee reports from the 52 Act is probably one of the most cited pieces of legislative history ever. Uh, it's brought up again and again and again in all these Section 101 cases uh, because I think it is clear that what Congress intended was for Section 101 uh, to be understood very broadly, to not be uh, much of a screen for uh, patentability, and instead to use things like 102, 103, etc., the uh, and 112 in particular as the, the, the more difficult screens. Okay. So this is uh, the, some key language here uh, and from Diamond versus Chakrabarty, right? Section 101, this is not to suggest, this is after they determine that this is likely to be patentable, this is not to suggest that, every one, that Section 101 has no limits or that it embraces every discovery. The laws of nature, physical phenomena, and abstract ideas have been held not patentable, right? That's... That area is some, the other aspects, right, uh, of uh, patentability that we're going to talk about um, in class 25, right? Thus, a new mineral discovered in the earth or a new plant found in the wild is not patentable subject matter, right? That's the natural versus non-natural distinction. Likewise, Einstein could not patent his celebrated law that E equals mc squared, nor could Newton patent the law of gravity. Those are... This, such our discoveries are manifestations of nature, free to all men and reserved exclusively to none. Right. So what Chakrabarty does is sets up this basic distinction here between discovery and invention. Right. And the the Chakrabarty court says that discovery is not patentable. That merely discovering something, right? And they, they're pretty specific about it, right? A new mineral discovered in the earth or a new plant found in the wild is not patentable subject matter, right? So discovery is not patentable, but invention is, right? So even if you have um, uh, something that's, that is, would otherwise be unpatentable because it would occur naturally, if you've invented it, then it is patentable. Right? So why this distinction? I think it's something of a puzzle why the court decides on this distinction. Now, one easily, easy and fairly formal answer is that the reason they did it is because this is what Congress said, right? I mean, Congress has a statutory, um, uh, has this legislative history where it suggests that this is uh, the line it would like to, to have drawn. But as a matter of policy, what what does this do for us uh, to have this particular line? And, and think about the, the hypo I have on the, on the screen there, which is if I spend $100 million to discover a naturally occurring product, right? So I comb the wilderness, you know, I, uh, you know, maybe search the various organisms that are growing uh, in the courtyard here at the, at the law school, whatever, um, and find uh, spend $100 million, find some sort of naturally occurring substance right, that uh, cures cancer. Have I in some way benefited society less than if I had spent that same $100 million uh, to create a synthetic product that has the same cancer curing properties? Both cases, the results are the same. Inputs are the same, $100 million, right? Um, and why are we going to give me a patent for one and not give me a patent for another, right? And note that this has import on incentives, right? I mean, the fact that I can get patents for the synthetic but not the, the natural means that I'm going to spend my valuable resources, time, energy, money, on creating new things rather than trying to discover new uses for old things. And that's something to think about. Is that an appropriate policy judgment um, that we're making in Section 101? And this is, this is why I was getting at earlier. What Section 101 at the end of the day really turns out to be is a statutory 
um, uh, component that is really fundamentally about policy trade-offs more than almost anything else uh, in the in the patent law. And we do. We make this discovery versus uh, invention distinction. I personally think it's difficult to see uh, how uh, these should be treated different. Um, and I think from an economic perspective, one might be troubled that we would incentivize um, creation of new things as opposed to the discovery of old things. On the other hand, you can certainly make arguments that uh, as long as we're giving these incentives to do things, why not uh, expand the, the total storehouse of knowledge more by trying to create entirely new um, uh, um, entirely new uh, products rather than simply use old products, right? So it could be that it's, we're better off as a society if people invent entirely new things. Um, maybe that's not only because the results would be the same either way, but they discover new things along the way, right? You, you start going down the road trying to find a substance that cures cancer and you end up finding one that cures baldness or whatever it is. Um, maybe we're better off that way uh, to, to encouraging people to, to spend their, their resources in, in that manner. But it is a policy choice that we've made and one that, that I think um, needs to be thought through. Right? And the other issue is, isn't there a lot of the biotech industry right, that is all about, I mean, isn't the modern biotech industry all about trying to figure out um, how we can use naturally occurring products, whether they're you know, things that are out there in the wild, um, well-known um, therapies, or even just our own bodies uh, to uh, create new and, and important applications, right? Uh, advances in genetics and targeted therapies, right? Therapies that are custom made for my genetic makeup. Isn't this going to be a problem um, when uh, given the, this particular um, ruling of Chakrabarty that is that if it's naturally occurring that you can't get a patent for it, right? Uh, and so this is a, a problem, and I'm sure you've all heard uh, that DNA patenting is has been going on for some time. Uh, the PTO issues lots and lots of DNA patenting. In fact, we're going to talk about a case involving that uh, in a moment. And are these how are these legitimate, right? Well, an important caveat to the Chakrabarty decision. Right is the the Park Davis decision, which actually is extremely old, right, uh, and dealt with insulin, right. So the material from adrenal glands is insulin, and the claim in Park Davis, this was before Judge Learned Hand, uh, was for an isolated and purified version of the material in adrenal glands, right. This is what we now know as insulin. And the court in uh, Park Davis found that this was indeed patentable under both Section 101 and under Section 102, right? So is it invalid in light of the natural product? Well, the court thought no because it actually, because it's isolated and purified, it is, although technically the same, not enough of the same to be truly identical as the naturally occurring product, right? The naturally occurring product, the one that actually occurs in adrenal glands, has contaminations in it. Um, it is uh, mixed in with some other chemicals in occasion. And so therefore, it's not quite the same as the isolated and purified version. Secondly, it doesn't run afoul of the natural products distinction. And the court in Park Davis says no, it does not, because it is not natural, right? It is different. It's distinct. Uh, and therefore, it is tantamount to being man-made, even though it's an isolated and purified version. All right. So Park Davis is important uh, because, and it, you know, the, the issue here is, can you reconcile Char Chakrabarty and Park Davis? And I think you can by understanding they're going at, in, in some level at the same thing, which is if it's not natural, if it's a man-made creation. And man-made creation is sort of drawn broadly here. It's not only sort of starting from scratch man-made, right, the, the organism in Chakrabarty, 
but it's also man-made in the sense that you isolate, purify, um, redevelop, recast, um, transmogrify something that did occur in nature, that that is patentable under Section 101. Now again, Section 102, 103, 112 may have different, different ways to deal with this, but we're just talking about Section 101 here. Right? And what do these holdings suggest about biotech patenting? Well, they suggest that full steam ahead. Right? I mean, this is, you know, the, the Chakrabarty and Park Davis combo have really built sort of biotech patenting. Now, that may not be good from a policy perspective. There are certainly plenty of, of um, academics who believe that we are over patenting in areas such as genetic material and DNA and things like that, and that is ultimately going to be um, socially detrimental. Uh, on the other hand, there are plenty of investors out there and plenty of companies that are built on the foundation. Their entire foundation is Chakrabarty and Park Davis, that they are making new therapies, developing targeted therapies using genetic material that is isolated, purified, adapted from humans um, in order to make therapies. Right? And, and indeed, some of the most important um, science that's being done right now at Penn uh, is exactly that. You take somebody's um, uh, genetic material, um, you uh, manipulate it, uh, and, and then re-inject it, uh, and the manipulation is, is intended to target particular kinds of, of diseases, right? It has the potential to sort of radically remake the way that we think about medicine. Right, and this is this is how this this gets patented. This is how we go forward uh, with patenting on all of this. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't policy questions, right? Um, you know, is there really much of a distinction between discovery and invention? Many people would argue there's really not. Although Chakrabarty seems to make sort of a big deal about this discovery invention distinction, it still seems to be the case that if I find a plant on the ground um, that is naturally occurring under Chakrabarty slash Park Davis, uh, I, can, uh, I can't claim the plant directly, uh, but if I isolate and purify uh, the particular material, uh, the active material that I find in that plant, then I can make out that claim, at least under Section 101. Uh, and so because of that, you might argue that, that what Chakrabarty was trying to do really has no moment, right? It doesn't actually limit patentability very much and maybe that's really what the court was trying to do and Chakrabarty has not really put the brakes on uh, this type of patentability um, but instead to to shift it over to sections 102, 103, etc. Another big issue is ownership related issues, right? So if we're going to allow pretty widespread patenting of natural materials by sort of this uh, Chakrabarty and Park Davis two-step Right, by allowing um, people to make claims to isolated and purified versions of natural things, um, then we have to face, I think, some ownership issues. Right? I mean, if, uh, you know, who owns um, that mold that's in the back of, of the classroom that you determine cures cancer? Is that owned by the University of Pennsylvania? Is that owned by you as the discoverer? How are we going to deal with these ownership issues? There's a lot of ownership issues with regards to, for example, um, materials that come from uh, rainforests like the Amazon and elsewhere where there are indigenous peoples who've lived there for generations and who may in fact have used these materials uh, for various therapies themselves and now we're finding uh, that they may have more widespread application. Now who owns the rights to use those outside the Amazon? Is that something that should go back to these indigenous peoples? Is that something that belongs to the government of, for example, Brazil? Um, or is that something that belongs to the, the people who spent the invest, who made the investments and made the discoveries itself? These are important ownership issues and frankly we have no idea how they're all going to be sorted out. Right? And, and I think that that's a consequence of um, the, the rapid development in this area and um, that we just haven't had much opportunity uh, to do that. And frankly, you know, it's, it's hard to trace the ownership issues. Right? I mean, if uh, a drug company in the U.S. finds, for example, some sort of uh, new material in the Amazon and brings it uh, uh, a sample back to the U.S. and then creates a synthetic compound based upon what they found, 
then what, right? Is that, have they derived that in some way from the natural component or have they merely used that as inspiration in which case we would wanna give them uh, the patent, the drug company, the patent here? Tough issues and, and ones that frankly have not really been sorted out. Finally, there's patenting of more complex organisms, right? Um, uh, can you patent your clone, right? Can I create uh, a clone of myself and patent it. Uh, I would find that incredibly helpful for getting my work done, obviously, so it would certainly meet the utility requirement. Uh, might have some novelty issues or some non-obviousness issues, but as a matter of Section 101, if it's not naturally occurring, and I can assure you that two of me are not naturally occurring, uh, then it looks like under Chakrabarty and Park Davis, uh, I may well be able to make out that claim. Um, what about um, chimeras, right? Half human, half animal um, uh, types of um, uh, organisms, right? Where you are genetically modifying animals, perhaps uh, manipulating them with, with human uh, genetic material to create entirely new organisms, right? Again, under Chakrabarty, that seems pretty clear. It's man made, the fact that it's living is not a bar, that's the basic holding of Chakrabarty, um, and yet uh, the PTO has rejected these. Um, they've rejected them for a whole variety of reasons. Um, probably the basic reason is that it's really creepy, um, but of course that's not a reason that the PTO can give. Um, they've given a variety of reasons like the 13th Amendment, uh, prohibition against uh, uh, slavery and, and things like that to try and justify denying patentability to any sort of um, uh, organism that includes he human DNA mixed with other uh, types of, of uh, genetic material. Um, those legal reasonings seem somewhat thin, um, but uh, nonetheless, probably a lot of people would agree that we don't want um, uh, people patenting or frankly even developing uh, those kinds of, of organisms. So again, that's something that has to be faced uh, um, head on, right? So the interesting thing about patenting life is that Chakrabarty was until very recently, until um, uh, just in the last couple years, the Supreme Court's latest word on biotech patentability. I mean, Chakrabarty sort of set, it's a 5-4 decision, sets this rule, um, interacts with Park Davis, and that's it. The, the Supreme Court sort of exits the field, and we don't hear from them anymore about what they think is going on. Um, uh, starting in the late 2000s, it became clear that uh, the Supreme Court was becoming much more interested in Section 101 issues. And in particular, in the LabCorp versus Metabolite case, there's a claim element in there um, that deals with correlating test results. And, and uh, they initially granted cert and then denied cert. But when they denied cert, um, uh, Justice Breyer wrote a long dissent um, that sort of explored the Section 101 issue and argued that the Supreme Court should re-enter um, the arena of Section 101 uh, because uh, over the last 30 years, 20, 30 years, um, that lots has changed in technology and biotechnology in particular in this, and the Federal Circuit has really taken a hands-off approach. I mean, after Chakrabarty, after uh, Park Davis, uh, the Federal Circuit was very clear that pretty much anything uh, was patentable as long as it met the criteria of being isolated and purified and or man-made, right? Um, and so that's uh, sort of where we stood uh, basically until this year. So the case I had you read, the other case is the Myriad case, right? And the Myriad case had three claims at issue. One was a composition of matter claims to the BARCA1 and 2 genes. These genes, for those of you uh, who may have uh, read about them, have uh, be are believed to be very important for, for 
um, targeting certain kinds of cancer, in particular breast cancer, right? So the, these particular genes um, are thought to be the key genes for um, identifying and understanding uh, breast cancer. Um, they also claimed methods of screening for cancer therapeutics and methods of comparing or analyzing uh, DNA sequences, right? The idea here is that what Myriad was going to do was build essentially diagnostic toolkits uh, and sell them. This was a commercial operation, right? So in order to do that, they had isolated the, the BARCA1 and 2 genes, uh, patented them, and then also our, uh, patented the way that they were um, going to use these genes to screen for therapeutics and also methods of comparing or analyzing uh, certain kinds of DNA sequences. Um, so the real, for our purposes here, the patenting life section we're just going to look at this composition set of claims. Now, we're going to talk about the other two, the methods of screening and the methods of comparing um, as part of our um, abstract ideas or, or natural laws discussion in the next class. I think it fits better there because that's a um, discussion that is more on point to those types of issues. Um, but let's look directly at these composition claims, right? So. The government argues to the Federal Circuit that these are unpatentable claims, that these, this genetic material is unpatentable. And the reason is they argue a, what they describe as the magic microscope test. Right? If the claim material could be viewed in the human body with a magic microscope, then it's unpatentable. Right? And because these genes actually do in fact exist in the human body in pretty much exactly the same way as the way that they are claimed, then because you could in theory find a microscope and if it was sufficiently magnified, you could actually see these genes inside a human body, it cannot be patentable. Right? The, the government says this would mean that isolated naturally occurring genes could not be patented, right? This, this would essentially do away with sort of the Park-Davis rule. Isolated and purified versions couldn't be patented, but purely synthetic genes, one that in fact do not occur in the U.S., or sorry, not in the U.S., in, in the human body, would be patentable, right? So that's the line the government was trying to draw, right? With the, the majority responds by with the following right it's undisputed that myriads claimed isolated dnas exist in a distinctive chemical form as a as distinctive chemical molecules from dnas in the human body native dna as the above description and they go through all of the kinds of differences between isolated and purified versions the claimed versions of the DNA and the ones that would exist in the human body. And in particular, the court focused on the chemical differences, how, you know, when you're in, when these genes are in the human body, they're bonded to a number of other chemicals, including other genes, including other types of, of material. Um, and, and those are all unclaimed, right? That's not part of the claim. What's claimed is just the isolated and purified versions. Right? As the above description indicates, isolated DNA is not just purified. It's not merely that they purify it, right? It's not merely that they get rid of all of the contaminants. It's that it's just different, right? It is, it is it's removed from its native cellular and chromosomal environment. It's also been manipulated chemically, so it's a molecule that is markedly different from that which exists in the body. And this is, this is the issue of the chemical bonds. Right. That, it, that, that they, they have, have to, to, in order to order isolate, isolate this particular, this particular strand, strand of DNA, DNA, they have to they break, have to break some chemical, some chemical bonds, bonds and reattach to other, other kind of kinds of bonds. The majority says, well, this is a different chemical molecule. molecule. It's just a it's different, different molecule, molecule than what exists, exists in the body because of that. Of that. Right? right? It may, in a sense, you may think about it the same way. Right? But it's really different. Right? Right? And, uh, and the interesting, interesting thing, thing here, here. Uh, is, is that what the, the uh, you know, the, the district court sort of took a different approach to this, right? The district court acknowledged that there were differences in the chemistry between the, the claims made by Myriad and what occurred in the, the, the human body. But what the district court said, well, is that we have to look at this from a 
look at this from a biological perspective. And the biological perspective says that, that the point of having DNA isn't chemistry as much as it is information. And that what DNA really is, is genetic information that can then be coded, transmitted, replicated into the things that make us who we are. And in that sense, what Myriad was claiming and what occurs in the body are indeed the same, right? The, the information content, the biological information content of the Myriad Barca 1 and Barca 2 claims are identical to what's in the human body. Indeed, that's the entire point and the reason that Myriad wants to make these claims because they are, diff they are the same and that they will then screen for certain kinds of genetic mutations that can then be used to create therapies or at least identify people at risk for breast cancer. That's why Myriad wants it. They want it for the, the informational content, and the informational content is indeed the same as what's in the body. The, the majority of the Federal Circuit, there was a vigorous dissent, uh, which I'm sure you read, um, uh, rejects this view. Right, saying that look, this is this is you know claims are to chemical compositions, right? The claims aren't to the biological functions, right? That Myriad isn't claiming the, the informational content. Myriad is just saying here's here's a chemical molecule, right? That I claim, and the fact that it's that it has uses for information is um, uh, is you know, the point and the use of it, and the court says that may go towards non-obviousness, perhaps, right? If it has exactly the same use as some other chemical compound, then it might be an obvious chemical compound, hard to know, but the court says that may be relevant in other respects. But, but for purposes of Section 101, they're claiming a chemical compound, and the chemical compound is indeed very different than what occurs in nature and therefore patentable, right? So I guess this is sort of left to you to figure out what you think about this, right? Is this indeed the right answer? I mean, the, again, the whole point of Myriad's patenting these genes was for the informational content, right? The genetic information. But the the you know at the at some formal level level the federal circuit is also correct, which is these are the same, right? Um, and so that's that's you know the the sort of big policy question. A another important policy question here uh, is that you know that the patent claims here appear to have a pretty substantial impact um, in the marketplace for testing and therapeutic screening for these particular particular genes and one of the reasons this case has attracted so much attention is that you know this is a important public health issue uh, we want to maximize access obviously to uh, therapies and screens that would allow for the detection and treatment of breast cancer which is uh, you know obviously one of the major cancers that kills a lot of people every year and allowing a patent uh, such as myriad's patent on uh, a very critical uh, screen uh, is uh, going to have a real impact in the market and and so many people are very interested in this case and argue that one of the reasons that Myriad shouldn't be able to maintain these patents is that they are uh, in some sense just too important uh, for uh, uh, the 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 amount of, of uh, value that Myriad has given back to society right and they may be right um, on the other hand, the question might be, you know, the response might be, is really Section 101 the right place to address those sorts of concerns, right? Is that what we want Section 101 to do, to try uh, to, you know, figure out whether or not um, the society is best served by allowing Myriad to, you know, and potentially corner the market for an important uh, cancer therapeutic uh, and screening mechanism. Uh, and I think in my own personal view is it is an, 
a critically important policy question, but my concern, I guess, with with that is that I think we don't want uh, to uh, use the patent law as too much of a lever for these types of policy questions. That, that I think the patent law works best if it is as neutral as possible. And it is certainly um, uh, possible to do other things if, if one is concerned about Myriad's market position. The government can purchase the, uh, the patent right, for example. The government uh, itself has the right to infringe and pay a compulsory license uh, for certain uh, for patents. Uh, so there are ways that that this could be broken, but it is certainly clear uh, that if Myriad maintains these claims, uh, this is going to be critically important to the future of of breast cancer research and therapy, uh, and Myriad will be right at the center uh, of that debate. Um, now, whether Section 101 is the appropriate vehicle. Uh, I think is a is a is an interesting and an open question, and that's the end of lecture twenty five, patentable subject matter part one, and I'll see you next time.